So, Senator Isaacson, let's pursue the higher education thing a little bit because yeah. that's an area that, that you've expressed yeah. uh, some <clears throat> interest in and, mm -hmm. and, of course, an area of employment and area you've been involved with for many years. Talk to us a little bit about how you see this unfolding in this year, what you'd like to see happen uh, in well, higher education. I have to say a couple of things. First of all, I have to give a lot of credit to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in the committee this year. Uh, while we've had some pretty sharp disagreements, it's probably been one of the most best-run bipartisan committees, and I am firmly convinced that all four of the five Republicans on there truly care almost as, almost as much as I do about higher education. Uh, and so with that said, I'll say, uh, unfortunately, I think that the target they were given by their leader was was wholly uh, inadequate. And, and the problem we have is that you have to look historically over the way we funded education, uh, regardless of whether or not the state wants to acknowledge the existence of inflation. If I buy a pencil for 10 cents one year, and I buy a pencil for 12 cents the next year, but I only give you 11 cents to buy it with, I'm cutting it short. Now, whether that's fair or not, because it is an increase, but it doesn't match the rate of what it costs to do business, we're still shorting education. And that's been part of the problem we have uh, with the way we look at higher education. Another part, you have to understand the layers that have been laid on each other. The second part of it is over the last eight years, we have made significant cuts, especially attacking administ administrative costs, both in University of Minnesota and Minn State. And so when you put those two things together and then you come back and want to cut some more, you're now cutting the bone, you're cutting the muscle. And I'll give you an example. As a professor, I can tell you that my rooms aren't nearly as clean as they used to be. I do some of that, and I'm okay, happy doing it, but we used to have staff that took care of that kind of stuff, the upkeep, the maintenance of the, of the school as part of what gets cut. When we're cutting money now, we're not just cutting frivolous things. We're cutting programming, we're cutting student experience, and we're cutting educational quality. And so uh, I think that uh, when we look at how much money we're spending, I get a little concerned that we're not recognizing what this investment is. University of Minnesota, 13 to 1. For every dollar we put in, it's $13 back for our state. If I walk up to any person and said, I can put a, a retirement fund together for you that pays 13 to 1, you drop every dollar you have into it. And so for me, what I'm concerned about is that we don't recognize the engine and the power that brings to our state. And the final part, I, I can probably talk about this for the rest of the show, so I'll, I'll shut up after this, is that I made this speech on the floor, and I, and I, I don't think it should be, should be lost on us, that when you look at the way states are often judged or measured, U.S. News and World Report did one where we're pretty much in, on 60 different measurements, we're like in the top five in almost all of them. That isn't by accident. It isn't because we've got good fishing, although I wish that was part of it. It isn't because of our lakes and our cold weather. It's because for the last 100 years, Minnesota has made an amazing effort to educate its people. And that's why we have more Fortune 500 companies per capita, the most nonprofits per capita, the highest voting rate per capita, one of the best environments that you can live in, some of the best schools in, in the country, some, some, one of a couple of them in the world. That, isn't, that is why. Our, our citizenry is so much ahead of the game compared to other places. And you look around the Midwest, you can see that stark difference. And so when you think about education, when we continue to cut that, all we're doing is cutting ourselves off the knees. And the microcosm example of that would be queer and technical education. We took that out of the K-12 system about 20 years ago, and we we're absolutely paying the price for that right now with the number of skilled manufacturing jobs we cannot feel, fill because they didn't have that. That's in a microcosm of what happens when you cut education and what we're going to experience 20 years from now. And that's what you mean when you talk about that, you're talking about what some called vocational education. Yeah, or, that's the traditional Or term. in my long ago past, we would have called shop class. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's went from shop class to vocational. Vocation now it's CTE. And, and it's gone from the public schools. Right, so. right. Yeah. Well, not all public schools. Because I tell you what, we've got a, a Kimball, for example, never got rid of their industrial arts, mm -hmm. kept their shop class mm -hmm. for the industrial arts. They are now trying to expand that because that is where they get all their open enrollment. They, yep. they, they can actually send a bus out to another school district That's interesting. and collect yep. and, and pick up students and bring them to their school because their industrial arts is a draw and it actually increases their student Absolutely. population because no one else has got it. Unfortunately, that is not anywhere near the norm. And no. I wish it was because Kimball would be a good example of what they're doing. And that's super powerful, but we don't have that. No school in my district has anything like that. And the other thing is, is, is in St. Cloud, they're actually partnering, partnering yeah. with the technical yep. colleges to get those classes. Yep. But I will say that we've got a lot of choices to make. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at, I just remember back in 2011-12 when we went to a shutdown over a $34.1 billion budget. Mm -hmm. Today, we're looking at a, about a $49 billion, give or take somewhat. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Right in there. 
Mm-hmm. That's a 44% increase in eight years. Mm-hmm. Who out there is earning 44% more money? Mm-hmm. Not very many people. But yet that's what we're trying to tell people that they need to give us. And if you look at the governor's proposal, it's a $12 billion increase for the next four years. Mm-hmm. So it's a huge increase. We can't afford it. We're, going, we're driving to a cliff. What we need to decide is, you know, when we're going to take that dollar, who are we taking that dollar from? Because governor, government doesn't have any money. They produce nothing. Mm-hmm. So we take money from people. Mm-hmm. So where are we going to take? We're going to take it from the PCA. We're going to take it from the disabled. We're going to take it. Who are we going to take the money from? We're going to take it from the veteran. We're going to take it from schools. We're going to make. Where are we taking the money from to create to to bring it to the government to put it out in our little pots of money? Mm-hmm. I will tell you that that we're putting about a the Senate proposal is just shy of a billion dollars in education, and we're t- getting told we're shortchanging them, mm-hmm. and that's K twelve mm-hmm. or E twelve, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And I agree when you look at the pie of where the money goes. Higher ed has been decreasing their share of the pie. Mm-hmm. The two that have been increasing, healthcare and, education. healthcare and education. So we have some tough decisions to make in those fields to try and decide how we either take care of the people that truly deserve mm-hmm. it and provide that money there or decide who we're taking the money from because we cannot continue down the road. So I have to say that um, in the framework of what she speaks, that makes sense. The problem is, is I would argue in many ways that argument, which I've heard from my friends across the aisle, is a reasoning fallacy because it creates an either-or scenario, right? It's either bankruptcy and desolation or we cut these programs and we survive. And that's just not how reality works, in my opinion. I get when you have the perspective. It all has to do with the framework. You come partisanly speaking. The framework from the Republican side is that the taxes are too high. They're too much of a burden. We absolutely have to stop spending, right? As Doubt used to say, we're going to starve the beast, right? Uh, the Repu- when the Democrats came in, they adjusted the, the fourth tier to make that a more balanced tax code that represents as a percentage of their income a more balanced way to look at it. And then when the Republicans came in, they provided a tax cut to corporations. And the problem we have isn't necessarily that because the tax cut to corporations or the tax increase. The problem we have is the partisanship causes it to seesaw back and forth, which creates instability. You cannot count on the money to be stable over time. So we come in and we raise the taxes. They go and they lower the taxes. We come in, we raise taxes, they, and it creates an instability. And the second problem that comes along with that that I think is even more important is that um, it is a priority thing, and, and it's an interesting take on your argument because that's always the question I have for my Republican friends. Well, if we're going to cut, tell me where, and then all I get is crickets because cutting is hard. Cutting is hard, and I think it's tough to say no to people. That's part of what being a legislator is all about. As soon as we have to do that, and I, I accept that. But the reality also is this. There's two sides of this story. There's the side you presented, which I think in many ways is a valid point, and I think an important part of the discussion. But the other side of it is this. What kind of state do we want to live in, and what are Minnesotans willing to invest in? That's the problem, and I believe that when they know what they're investing in, they're okay spending the money, and they're okay with raising the taxes. And the, what is proof in the pudding on that is that this governor ran hardcore on a gas tax increase and won by the widest margin we've seen in recent history, the widest margin. So that tells me the people of Minnesota know I'm okay with the gas tax. Now, are they okay with 20 cents? I didn't say that. He didn't run on a 20 I didn't cent. Say, I he didn't ran, say he that. ran on a 10 cent. Is I what did, he well, did. And he doubled it, <laughs> thinking the negotiations he's going to get half and end up at 10. Well, that's, and, and would I think, that be any surprise to you with the way the legislature operates? I mean, is that a shocking development that he walked in with a savvy decision on how to present it to you guys, knowing you would cut and it? And we're not going there anyway. Well, you know what I'm saying. The point is, is that, is that I think Minnesota understands what it means to invest. And for as many people as I hear about the gas tax problem or as many people as I hear about the roads and want them fixed and are okay paying that. Now, is the gas tax really the way to solve this? No, because it does have a regressive element to it. And because as we get away from gas, it's not going to be an effective source of income. We've got to get better at that.